Why did your bride ruin her perfect wedding? Story 1. When my wife and I decided to elope and tie the knot overseas, it was a decision fueled by our love for adventure and a desire to keep things simple. The ceremony was intimate, just the two of us against a backdrop of breathtaking scenery, and it felt like a fairy tale come to life. We were both on cloud nine, basking in the joy of our new life together. However, once we got back home, my family insisted on hosting a big party to celebrate with everyone who wasn't there. Family, friends, and even a few distant relatives who always seemed to turn up at these things. I wasn't entirely sold on the idea of a formal celebration, but I wanted to keep the peace. My wife and I went along with it, figuring that a gathering with everyone would be a nice way to bridge our private elopement with the traditional expectations of our families. Plus, we thought it could be fun, a chance to relive some of the magic of our wedding day. Well, the speeches were our downfall. My dad, who had always been a bit old-fashioned, was eager to say a few words. He's the type who likes to hold court at family gatherings, sharing stories and dispensing what he thinks are pearls of wisdom. I stood there with my arm around my wife, feeling on top of the world as he took the microphone. But then with a big, proud smile on his face, he called my wife by my ex-girlfriend's name. The moment he said it, I felt like the air had been sucked out of the room. It was as if someone had poured ice water down my spine. I tried to convince myself I'd misheard, that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But my older sister, who was standing right next to me, let out a soft but unmistakable gasp. She buried her face in her hands, and I could see her shoulders slump with embarrassment. A wave of discomfort rippled through the crowd, a collective cringe that seemed to echo in the silence that followed. My father didn't even notice at first. He kept talking, seemingly oblivious to the bomb he had just dropped. It wasn't until my mom, who was sitting near the front, quietly corrected him that he realized what he'd done. He laughed it off awkwardly, tried to make a joke of it, and then corrected himself. But the damage was done. The mood in the room had shifted, and there was no recovering from it. I could see the discomfort on my wife's face. She tried to brush it off, to laugh along with everyone else, but I knew her well enough to see that it had hurt her. And it wasn't just her. It felt like the night had taken a nosedive. People tried to keep the party going, but the energy had fizzled out. Conversations became stilted, laughter felt forced, and no one really knew what to say or do to smooth things over. For the rest of the night, I was stuck in my own head, replaying the moment over and over again. My dad, bless him, apologized later, but the awkwardness had already set in like a stain that couldn't be scrubbed out. What should have been a joyful celebration turned into a series of uncomfortable interactions as people tried to navigate the tension that hung in the air. By the end of the night, I just wanted to get out of there. My wife and I thanked everyone for coming, made our excuses, and left early. As we drove home in silence, I couldn't help but feel like the perfect bubble of happiness we'd created during our elopement had been popped. It wasn't just about the name slip. It was the realization that no matter how much you try to create your own path, you can't always escape the past. Once we got home, we sat in the car for a moment, neither of us saying anything. Finally, I turned to my wife, took her hand, and told her how sorry I was for what happened. She gave me a small smile and squeezed my hand, telling me it was okay, that these things happen, but I could still see the hurt in her eyes. Story 2 A few years back, when I was living in another state, I missed out on a wedding that turned into one of those stories that you'd think only happens in movies. I didn't get the details firsthand, but from what I've been told by my family and friends, it was a night that no one who was there will ever forget. I still find myself shaking my head whenever the story comes up. So, here's how it went down. The wedding itself was beautiful, everything you'd expect from a well-planned ceremony. The bride and groom were madly in love, the weather was perfect, and everyone was in high spirits as they moved from the church to the reception hall. You know how these things go, lots of laughter, music, and plenty of alcohol flowing to keep the good times rolling. Now, the best man, a longtime friend of the groom, was one of those guys who knows how to have a good time. He's the life of the party, always cracking jokes and making sure everyone is having as much fun as he is. But that night, he may have had a bit too much fun. From what I hear, he started hitting the bottle early and didn't slow down until he was well past tipsy and deep into drunken territory. As the reception went on, the best man's drinking began to catch up with him. At some point, he decided that he needed to lie down and get some sleep. Now here's where things start to go sideways. Instead of finding a quiet corner inside the reception hall, this guy thought it would be a good idea to crawl under the bride's car in the parking lot. Don't ask me what kind of logic led him there, but in his booze-soaked brain, it must have made perfect sense. Maybe he was looking for a cool, dark place away from the noise. Maybe he thought he was being clever. Who knows? Anyway, there he was, passed out under the car, dead to the world. The bride, on the other hand, wasn't much of a drinker. After a while, she decided to give one of the guests a ride to their hotel down the street. Completely unaware of the human obstacle beneath her vehicle, 
she got into the driver's seat, started the engine, and prepared to drive off. I think you can see where this is heading. As soon as she started moving, it became painfully obvious that something was wrong. The car jolted slightly, and that's when people started realizing what had happened. Panic ensued. Some guests screamed. Others rushed to stop the car. The best man was dragged out from under the vehicle, bloodied and battered, but by some miracle still alive. It was one of those moments where time seems to slow down, and everyone is scrambling, trying to make sense of what just happened. The reception, as you can imagine, came to an abrupt halt. The bride was in shock. The groom was frantic, and the guests were left standing around, stunned and unsure of what to do. Instead of dancing the night away, most of the wedding party ended up spending the night in the hospital, waiting for news on the best man's condition. The next day was supposed to be filled with post-wedding brunches and stories about the night before, but instead, it was spent in hushed conversations in hospital waiting rooms. The best man, remarkably, pulled through without any life-threatening injuries, though he was pretty banged up and had a rough recovery ahead of him. The incident left a lasting mark on the wedding. What should have been remembered as a joyful celebration turned into a cautionary tale about the dangers of mixing too much alcohol with bad decisions. For weeks, the story made the rounds among our circle of friends and family, everyone adding their own bits and pieces of information, turning it into a kind of legend. The best man became infamous for his unfortunate nap spot, and the whole thing turned into a darkly humorous anecdote that people would bring up from time to time, always with a shake of the head and a can you believe that actually happened? Story 3. Before I came into the picture, my mom and dad were on the verge of what was supposed to be their big day, their wedding. My dad was the kind of guy who liked to be prepared, always ready to step in and make sure things ran smoothly. So naturally, he arrived at the church early that morning. He wanted to oversee the final touches, check that everything was in place, and make sure the day would go off without a hitch. He was excited, nervous in that good way, the way that makes you feel like your whole life is about to change for the better. Meanwhile, my mom was tasked with picking up the wedding cake. It was a small errand, but an important one. She had the job of transporting the cake that would be the centerpiece of the reception, the one that everyone would ooh and ah over before slicing into it to celebrate the start of her and my dad's new life together. But as she drove towards the church, something shifted. When she turned onto the street and saw all the cars lined up, the familiar faces of family and friends gathering outside, waiting for her to arrive, it hit her like a ton of bricks. The weight of the day, the pressure, the finality of it all, it became too much. Every doubt she'd ever had came flooding into her mind. The thought of walking down that aisle, of standing in front of all those people, committing her life to someone, scared her more than she could handle. So instead of pulling into the parking lot, instead of facing the crowd that was waiting for her, she did the only thing that made sense to her in that moment. She kept driving. She drove right past the church, not slowing down, not even thinking to stop. She just kept going headed straight back to her apartment, the wedding cake still in the back seat, untouched and pristine. At the church, my dad waited. At first, there was confusion. Where was she? Maybe she'd gotten stuck in traffic. Maybe there was a delay at the bakery. But as the minutes turned into an hour and then another, the realization began to settle in. She wasn't coming. The guests were ushered out quietly, whispers spreading through the crowd. The wedding was called off, and my dad was left standing there, the day he'd been so excited for unraveling right before his eyes. He eventually made his way back home, trying to make sense of what had happened. When he walked through the door, there was my mom, sitting at the kitchen table, the wedding cake in front of her. She'd already cut into it, was eating it with a fork, still in her regular clothes, as if the wedding was just another event she'd decided to skip. There was no dramatic confrontation, no heated argument, just the quiet, devastating reality that she couldn't go through with it. I can only imagine the silence that must have filled that kitchen. My dad, standing there in disbelief, Seeing the wedding cake, a symbol of the celebration that never happened, being casually eaten as though it was just any other cake. My mom, likely too overwhelmed to say anything, already knowing that her actions had spoken louder than any words could. It was a moment that sealed their fate. The wedding that was supposed to bring them together only highlighted the cracks that had already begun to form. They didn't last long after that day. My dad, heartbroken and probably a little resentful, couldn't move past what had happened. And my mom, who had been unable to face the pressure of the wedding, couldn't find a way to make the relationship work after that. Story 4. The day had started with so much promise. The bride and groom had been eagerly anticipating their wedding day for months, meticulously planning every detail to ensure it would be a day filled with love, laughter, and cherished memories. Friends and family had gathered from far and wide to witness their union, and the air was thick with excitement and anticipation as the ceremony began. In the middle of the ceremony, as the officiant was speaking, the bride suddenly went pale. 
her smile fading into a look of pain and confusion. She clutched her stomach, a small gasp escaping her lips as she doubled over slightly. At first, everyone thought it might just be nerves, but within moments, it became clear that something was terribly wrong. The groom, now panicked, rushed to her side, supporting her as she swayed on her feet in what felt like an eternity, but was probably only a few minutes. An ambulance was called, and paramedics arrived. They confirmed what everyone feared. The bride was having a miscarriage. The joyful day had taken a tragic turn, and instead of heading to the reception hall, the bride and groom were rushed to the hospital. Back at the reception, the atmosphere was surreal. The guests had all gathered at the venue, unsure of what to do or say. The room, once filled with the sounds of clinking glasses and happy chatter, was now silent. The weight of what had just happened pressing down on everyone. Yet, despite the tragedy, the families of the bride and groom insisted that the reception continue. Perhaps they thought it was what the couple would have wanted. Or maybe they were simply trying to salvage something from the day. Whatever the reason, the decision was made to go ahead with the planned speeches, the first dance, and the cake cutting, without the bride and groom. As the best man took the microphone to deliver his speech, his voice was shaky, the words feeling hollow and out of place. He spoke of the couple's love, their future together, and the happiness they'd brought to each other's lives. But every sentence was tinged with the bitter knowledge of what had just occurred. The maid of honor followed, her speech equally strained, trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy in a situation that was anything but normal. The first dance was perhaps the most heart-wrenching part of the evening. The band began to play the song that the bride and groom had carefully chosen, a song that was supposed to mark the beginning of their journey together. But instead of the newlyweds taking to the dance floor, it was left empty, the music filling the room like a sad echo of what could have been. Some of the guests danced awkwardly, unsure whether to join in or simply stand by, their steps heavy with the weight of the day's events. The cake, a beautiful, multi-tiered creation, sat untouched for a long time. Eventually, someone suggested cutting it, and so they did, quietly, almost somberly, as if the act itself was an afterthought rather than a celebration. Guests lined up for slices, but few actually ate them, the sweet taste now tainted by the bitter reality of the day. As the night dragged on, the mood in the room became increasingly uncomfortable. Conversations were stilted, laughter forced, and many guests quietly slipped out, unable to bear the strange juxtaposition of a party that should have been joyous, now overshadowed by grief. The reception that was supposed to be a celebration of love had turned into a surreal gathering of people going through the motions, trying to make the best of an unimaginable situation. Story 5 First, there was my father. He'd always been a bit of a wild card, but I never expected him to bring his mistress to my wedding. The very woman who had been the catalyst for the collapse of his marriage to my stepmother, someone I adore and had warmly invited to the wedding. My stepmother is one of the kindest souls you'd ever meet, and seeing her uncomfortable because of my father's insensitivity was heartbreaking. This woman, who had caused so much pain, ended up in a lot of our wedding photos, standing there like she belonged, her presence a stark reminder of all the turmoil she'd stirred up in our family. As if that wasn't enough, she decided to bring along my half-brother, who was only two years old at the time. I'd made it clear that we wanted an adult-only ceremony, just something small and intimate. But there he was, babbling away during the ceremony, disrupting the quiet moments, and even trying to toddle down the aisle. It was one of those things that you try to laugh off at the time, but deep down, I was frustrated. It was another reminder that the day wasn't going as planned. The whole wedding had already been through a major adjustment before it even began. I'd been diagnosed with POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, not long before, and it forced us to change our plans from a beautiful outdoor ceremony at Lake Tahoe to something more manageable at my in-law's house. It was a tough pill to swallow, but I tried to make the best of it. Still, I couldn't escape the fact that I had to sit through my own wedding ceremony, something I never imagined I'd have to do. I tried to focus on the vows, on the love I had for my spouse, but it was hard not to feel a pang of disappointment at how much had to be adjusted because of my health. Then, on the morning of the wedding, I got a call from my cousin, the one who was supposed to be our photographer. She told me she couldn't make it, just like that hours before the ceremony. I was stunned. It was like the hits kept coming, and I was starting to feel like the universe was conspiring against us. Thankfully, our hairdresser, who had seen her fair share of weddings, stepped in. She did her best to take the photos, and to her credit, they turned out really well. But still, it was a last-minute scramble that I hadn't anticipated, and it added to the stress of the day. As if all of that wasn't enough, my brother-in-law was visibly angry throughout the entire ceremony. He was a groomsman. And every time I glanced over at him, there he was, scowling at the camera or staring daggers at the floor while everyone else had their heads bowed in prayer. He's an atheist, 
and he made it clear beforehand that he didn't approve of his brother's Christian beliefs. His disapproval was written all over his face, and it's there, captured in every photo, a sour note that overshadowed what should have been a joyful occasion. But the hardest blow of all came from my own mother. She didn't show up, just didn't come. I knew she'd been struggling with depression, but it still hurt more than I can put into words that she couldn't make it, not even for the short ceremony. She'd been such an important part of my life, and not having her there left a gaping hole in the day. A few months later, she took her own life. The pain of her absence on my wedding day is now intertwined with the grief of losing her for good. It's a wound that still hasn't healed, and I'm not sure it ever will. Story 6. This isn't about my wedding, but it's a story that still sits with me, even after all these years. It's one of those things that seems minor on the surface, but the way it played out left a lasting mark on more than I ever thought it would. So, this happened the day before my cousin's wedding. My cousin's mom, my Aunt Dee, is someone I've always looked up to. She's the kind of person who's always been there for me. Loving, supportive, and usually the glue that holds our family together. But in the lead-up to her son's big day, she was understandably stressed out, trying to make sure everything went off without a hitch. Weddings have a way of bringing out the best and the worst in people, and I guess this was one of those moments where the stress got the better of her. The day before the wedding, we were all at the church, decorating and getting everything ready for the rehearsal. It was a busy, chaotic day, but we were all in good spirits, excited about what was to come. Out of nowhere, my dad disappeared for a bit, and when he came back, he had this random sandwich with him. It wasn't part of any planned meal or anything, he just showed up with it, thinking I might be hungry. Now I love my dad, but he's always been a little absent-minded, and this was one of those times when that side of him showed up. He handed me the sandwich, and I could immediately smell the tuna. The thing is, I'm allergic to tuna, pretty severely in fact. So I thanked him for thinking of me, but had to remind him that I couldn't eat it. I didn't make a big deal out of it. I just suggested that maybe one of my sisters would like it instead. My dad, being my dad, just shrugged it off with a smile and said something like, Oh right, I forgot. No problem. And that was that, or so I thought. But then, Aunt Dee overheard the exchange, and for some reason she got really upset about it. I could see the tension in her face as she walked over and said, in a voice that was a little sharper than I'd ever heard from her, that I had ruined the wedding. I was taken aback, completely blindsided by her reaction. How could something as trivial as not eating a sandwich the day before the wedding have such an impact? It didn't make any sense to me. I tried to explain gently that I couldn't eat tuna because of my allergy, but it was like she wasn't even listening. She just kept going, saying how much effort everyone was putting into making the wedding perfect and how this little thing had thrown everything off balance. I stood there, feeling smaller with every word she said, a knot forming in my stomach. I knew she was stressed, and I wanted to be understanding. But it really hurt to be told that I'd ruined something so important, especially over something so trivial and beyond my control. The rest of the day went on, but the mood had shifted for me. I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd somehow messed up, even though logically I knew it was irrational. I kept thinking about it, trying to figure out what I could have done differently. Maybe I should have just taken the sandwich and quietly given it to someone else without saying anything. Maybe I should have been more sensitive to how on edge everyone was. But in the end, there wasn't much I could do to change what happened. The wedding itself went off without any issues, and everyone seemed to enjoy the day. But even as I watched my cousin exchange vows and celebrate with his new spouse, Aunt Dee's words echoed in the back of my mind. I didn't bring it up again. I didn't want to add any more stress or drama to the day. But the whole situation left me feeling pretty bad about myself. It's not like I think about it all the time, but whenever weddings come up in conversation, or when I see Aunt Dee, I can't help but remember that moment. Years later, it still baffles me. Why did something so insignificant trigger such a strong reaction? I've come to realize that it probably wasn't about the sandwich at all. It was more about the pressure Aunt Dee was feeling, and I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But knowing that doesn't completely erase the sting of being told I'd ruined something so important to someone I care about. Story 7 the first hiccup came from my husband's best friend, who had been a constant in his life and was supposed to be a major part of our big day. But as luck would have it, he decided he couldn't make it to our wedding because he had to get married first, on the same day, no less. It was a shock and a bit of a letdown, but we tried to roll with it, focusing on the people who were there to celebrate with us. The real trouble started with the park where we had planned to hold both the wedding and the reception. We had chosen this spot because of its beautiful grassy area and a stunning overlook of the city. It was supposed to be the perfect backdrop for our special day. The park management had promised us that they would open the service gate so that we could easily bring in all the party essentials, tables, chairs, the cake, and so that our handicapped guests could get to the site without any issues. They also assured us that the restrooms closest to the site would be available for our guests. 
but on the day of the wedding, none of that happened. The gate stayed locked, and the restrooms were closed. We were left scrambling to move everything ourselves, and my handicapped guests had to struggle to find access to the facilities. As a result, we had to move the entire wedding to a different spot in the park. The only available area with any shade was a patch of ground wedged between a dirt ditch and a bunch of pine needles. It was a far cry from the lush grass and scenic overlook we had envisioned. Instead of a picturesque backdrop, we were stuck with an ugly, dry area that didn't exactly scream romantic wedding. As if that wasn't enough, my bouquet wasn't ready on time. I ended up waiting an extra 20 minutes, which made me late getting to the park. By the time I arrived, the heat had already done a number on my hair and makeup, leaving me looking less like a bride and more like someone who had just run a marathon. To top it off, my husband-to-be, who had arrived on time, was all set and ready to go a full half hour before the ceremony was supposed to start, and I wasn't even dressed yet. The whole timeline was thrown off, and we started the day feeling rushed and disheveled. Then there were the centerpieces. I had envisioned these beautiful floating rose bowls, simple yet elegant. But when I saw them, they were just glass bowls filled with rocks. No water, no roses floating on top. Somehow, in the chaos of the day, nobody had bothered to fill them. So instead of the centerpiece I'd imagined, we had bowls of rocks sitting on the tables, which felt like a perfect metaphor for how the day was going. And then there was the cake. Somehow, in the midst of everything, pine needles had found their way into it. I still don't know how that happened, but there they were. Little green intruders in what was supposed to be a beautiful white wedding cake. It was one of those moments where you just have to laugh because if you don't, you'll cry. Adding to the chaos was a man from a nearby adult day center who somehow ended up at our wedding. He wasn't part of the guest list, but there he was, wandering around, helping himself to soda cans, and nearly walking off with my wedding shoes. It was one more bizarre twist in a day that was already full of them. Because we had to move the wedding location, we ended up in a spot without any overhead lights, which meant that by the time it got dark, we couldn't do the bouquet toss or the champagne toast. What should have been fun? Memorable moments were instead lost in the shuffle. My sister, who was supposed to start my wedding march music, didn't hit play until I was already three-quarters of the way down the aisle. So instead of a grand entrance, I ended up with a hurried walk to the altar, half in silence. And then, my husband, who wasn't familiar with the area, got frustrated when he realized the bathrooms were closed. He left the park to find another restroom, and when he finally returned two hours later, most of the guests had already left. He missed out on saying goodbye to everyone, which really upset him and put a damper on what was left of the evening. To top it all off, I still haven't gotten my deposit back for the park, or the tables and chairs we rented. It's been three weeks, and I'm still chasing after that money, which feels like the final insult after everything that went wrong. Story 8. I wasn't the one getting married, but I ended up with a front row seat to one of the most chaotic weddings I've ever witnessed. The whole event was like watching a train wreck in slow motion. You couldn't look away, even though you knew it was all going horribly wrong. To this day, it's a story I'll never forget, though it's one that no one dares to bring up around the couple anymore. First off, the cake. They found a picture online of the most stunning wedding cake you can imagine, something that looked like it belonged on the cover of a bridal mag. But instead of hiring a professional baker to recreate it, they handed the task off to an aunt who had never made anything more complicated than a birthday cake. The result? Let's just say it looked more like a lopsided tower of sadness than the elegant confection they had envisioned. People tried to be polite, but there were whispers and side glances when it was time to cut the cake. You could tell everyone was thinking the same thing. What happened? Then there was the music or the lack thereof. Rather than springing for a professional DJ, they thought they could save money by asking a friend who played guitar to handle the music for the ceremony and the first dance. The rest of the music was supposed to be on a USB stick they'd prepared, but on the day of the wedding, it was nowhere to be found. No one could remember where it ended up, and there was a bit of a panic until someone finally pulled out a phone and started streaming music off YouTube. The reception soundtrack ended up being a random mix of whatever the phone could pull up, with people occasionally huddling around to choose the next song. The actual ceremony on the beach was a whole other level of disaster. The bride wanted a live rendition of her aisle song, with the guitar guy playing and a friend singing. But no one had thought about how to amplify the sound on an open beach. At the last minute, they managed to find a gas generator to power some makeshift amps, but that thing was louder than a freight train. The generator's roar nearly drowned out the music, and the bride had to walk down a path that was way longer than anyone anticipated about 200 meters. They had to restart the song twice because she was still so far away from the groom, and by the time she finally got there, it was hard to hear anything over the generator's constant droning. After the ceremony, the reception was supposed to kick into high gear, but the venue crew had only been hired for a few hours. They started packing up long before the party was over. People were still ready to celebrate, 
but with the tables and decorations being taken down around them, the whole vibe started to fizzle out. That's when the guests, not ready to call it a night, migrated to the parking lot. What followed was something like a reverse tailgate party. People popped open their car trunks, grabbed whatever drinks they had, and continued the party out there. It was bizarre, like the reception had been unceremoniously relocated to the asphalt. The bride understandably wasn't thrilled with how things were turning out. Later, she took to Facebook to scold everyone for abandoning them during what was supposed to be the biggest night of their lives. I get it, she was upset. But by then, most of the guests had made peace with the fact that this wedding was more about surviving the chaos than enjoying a flawless event. Despite everything that went wrong, the couple did make it through the day and are still happily married. They have a couple of adorable kids now, and while the wedding was a disaster by any measure, the marriage has turned out just fine. In the end, that's what really matters. The wedding is just one day. And as much as people like to say it sets the tone for the marriage, the reality is that the wedding is just a snapshot in time. What counts is everything that comes after. Story 9. When my husband and I got engaged, we were over the moon. It was one of those moments where everything feels perfect. And you start dreaming about how your wedding day will be, imagining the love, joy, and celebration with the people closest to you. But those dreams quickly started to feel more like a nightmare when my stepmother decided she was going to take control of the entire wedding planning process. It all began right after the proposal. My stepmom immediately declared herself our wedding coordinator. My husband and I were hesitant, but she and my dad leaned on us hard, pointing out that they were going to pay for everything. That was our first warning sign, but we gave in, figuring it might be easier to let her take the reins. We planned to get married a year later, thinking we'd have plenty of time to figure out the details. But that wasn't how it went. From the get-go, my stepmom was insistent that everything had to be booked and paid for 11 months before the wedding, even though that meant rushing through decisions we weren't ready to make. I had always dreamed of a small, intimate beach wedding, just immediate family and a few close friends. But my parents kept telling me it was impossible, that it would be too expensive. I was disappointed but reluctantly agreed to consider other options. It wasn't until later that I found out the real reason behind their refusal. They had already invited around 100 of their friends and co-workers, telling them they'd be receiving invitations soon. They weren't just planning my wedding, they were planning their own event. In the end, my stepmom convinced us to have the wedding at a golf course that was far from what I'd imagined. It was surrounded by houses and desert, the complete opposite of the peaceful beach setting I had wanted. She picked out the colors, the DJ, the flowers, and even the wedding party, leaving me feeling completely sidelined. By this point, I was beyond stressed, and the cost had already ballooned to around $25,000. It wasn't the wedding I wanted, and I felt like I was losing control of my own day. The final straw came when I asked about getting a mother of the bride flower pin for my biological mother, who I have a good relationship with and who was really excited about the wedding. My stepmom lost it. In the middle of a crowded floral shop, in front of the owner who we'd known for years, she screamed at me, calling me ungrateful and stupid for even suggesting it. I was stunned and started crying right there in the shop. Instead of calming down, she yelled at me even more for crying. It was humiliating and heartbreaking. When I told my fiancé what had happened, he was just as upset as I was. He suggested that we put a stop to everything because it was clear that this wedding wasn't ours anymore. We went to my dad and told him we were done with the way things were going. His response? He canceled everything and backed out of paying for any wedding that wasn't what he and my stepmom had envisioned. It was a gut punch, but it was also the push we needed to take back control. With only four months to go until the original wedding date, my husband and I decided to move the wedding up by a week and relocate to a beach in Santa Barbara. We hired a coordinator who actually listened to what we wanted, and we started planning the wedding we had always dreamed of. It was simple, elegant, and exactly what we needed. My stepmom refused to come, but my dad did show up. Unfortunately, that didn't go smoothly either. At one point during the day, he tried to choke and punch my aunt, his older sister, in the parking lot. Apparently, old grudges had flared up, and it turned into a nasty scene. I was furious and decided there was no way I was letting him walk me down the aisle after that. We told him that if he caused any more trouble, we'd call the police. But my aunt, who's pretty tough and didn't want to make a big deal out of it, insisted we let it go. Still, it put a dark cloud over what should have been a happy day. Despite the drama, the actual wedding turned out to be wonderful. We spent only $3,000, which included decorations, the cake, the hotel, and the reception at a gorgeous wine and tapas place in Montecito. It was intimate, beautiful, and most importantly, it felt like our day. To top it all off, on the original date that had been set for the wedding, there was a massive brush fire, and the golf course where we were supposed to get married caught fire. It felt like fate was on our side, helping us dodge what could have been an even worse disaster. Story 10. The trouble started with the best man's girlfriend. She had already been drinking before the reception even began. 
and as the night went on, her mood took a sharp turn for the worse. She was furious that she wasn't seated at the bridal party table, despite the fact that this had been the plan all along. She wasn't part of the bridal party after all, and there were only so many seats at the head table. But in her drunken state, she took it as a personal slight, and that's when things started to spiral out of control. Instead of letting it go or talking it out, she decided to confront my maid of honor about it. What began as a heated conversation quickly escalated into a full-blown altercation. The girlfriend started shouting and trying to physically fight my maid of honor, who was just as shocked as everyone else by the sudden outburst. The venue staff stepped in to try and defuse the situation, but the girlfriend wasn't having any of it. She turned her anger towards them, and it wasn't long before the best man got involved as well. He was angry too. Angry at his girlfriend for causing a scene, angry at the situation, and probably embarrassed by how everything was unfolding in front of all our guests. Instead of trying to calm things down, he decided that the best course of action was to leave. So just as the reception was getting started, the best man and his girlfriend stormed out, leaving a trail of chaos in their wake. But the drama didn't end there. The best man and his girlfriend headed back to one of the on-site cabins where we were all staying. Fueled by alcohol and anger, they trashed the place. Furniture was overturned, belongings were thrown around, and the whole cabin was left in a state of disarray. Eventually, things got so out of hand that the police were called, and the girlfriend was taken away in handcuffs. In the middle of what was supposed to be the happiest night of our lives, my husband and I were pulled aside to talk to the police. It was surreal and incredibly stressful, standing there in our wedding attire, trying to explain the situation to the officers while our guests were left wondering what on earth was going on. We did our best to put on brave faces and not let it ruin the night, but the damage was already done. For my husband, the hardest part was that the best man, the friend he'd known for 14 years, someone he considered like a brother, had been at the center of this disaster. The betrayal cut deep, and it cast a shadow over what should have been a night of pure celebration. My husband was devastated, not just because of the ruined reception, but because he knew that his friendship with the best man would never be the same again. It's been two and a half months since the wedding, and we still haven't spoken to the best man or his girlfriend. The whole incident left such a sour taste that neither of us has felt ready to reach out or try to mend things. My husband lost one of his closest friends that night, and while time might heal the wounds, it's hard to imagine things ever going back to the way they were. Despite everything, we tried to salvage the rest of the evening. We danced, we laughed, and we did our best to focus on the love and support from the friends and family who were there for us. But the memory of that night is forever tinged with the chaos and drama that unfolded, and it's something we'll never forget. Story 11 it all started with a back injury that seemed minor at first, but quickly escalated into something far worse. The injury eventually left me paralyzed in one leg, and just two months before the wedding, I lost my job because of it. That was the first major blow, but it was far from the last. My fiancé, stressed and exhausted, went to her final dress fitting, only to throw up on her wedding dress. We spent a fortune getting it cleaned, but there was still a faint mark, a lingering reminder of how things were starting to unravel. I had surgery to correct my back issue about a month and a half before the wedding, and for a brief moment, it seemed like everything would be okay. I was able to walk again, unaided, and I started to think that maybe our luck was turning around. But then, about two weeks before the wedding, my back pain came roaring back. It got so bad that I couldn't move without experiencing terrible spasms. The pain was unbearable, and I ended up in the hospital, hooked to a morphine drip, pumped full of diazepam, and waiting for the agony to subside. My spine was crooked, and every step felt like torture. A week before the wedding, I was discharged from the hospital, barely able to walk, and with nothing but a pair of crutches to help me move. We had to drive 1,200 miles to the wedding location, and I was determined to stand up at my wedding, even if it meant being heavily the whole time. I was on a cocktail of painkillers, hydrocodone, Valium, you name it, just to keep the pain at bay, but the side effects were brutal. During our two-day road trip, I learned the hard way that withdrawing from morphine can lead to some nasty side effects. Diarrhea hit me hard, and I found myself in a desperate situation on a remote highway. By the time we found a restroom, it was an emergency. I couldn't bend over well because of my back, and the effort to hold everything in only made things worse. The mess I made in that restroom was horrific. Something out of a nightmare. I, a grown man, cried. But through it all, my fiancé stayed strong, cleaned up, and helped me finish. That was the moment I knew just how much she truly loved me. When we finally arrived at our destination, it was a week before the wedding. I managed to get my hands on a walker, and I began practicing standing and walking despite the immense pain. I was up to my eyeballs on painkillers, trying to stay awake with energy drinks, but I slept a lot too, exhausted from the constant battle with my body. 
We still had to get our marriage license, which meant appearing in person at the courthouse. The parking was far from the entrance, and by the time we got there, I was so worn out that the clerk almost didn't issue the license, unsure if I was even capable of consenting. The day before the wedding, we checked into our suite. It was supposed to be a time of final preparations and relaxation, but while my fiancé was off with her bridesmaids, I was left alone in the room. I tried to get comfortable on the couch, but I didn't have the strength to stop myself from falling over. I ended up in agony, screaming for help, alone in the hotel room. It felt like hours before one of my fiancé's friends heard me and got the front desk to let them in. My aunt and uncle sat with me until more people arrived, and eventually my best man took over, allowing my fiancé to focus on getting ready for the wedding. Then came the ceremony. We didn't know at the time that my fiancé's sister was an addict, but it quickly became clear when she showed up high on opiates. She talked through the entire ceremony, and you can hear her on the video, embarrassing herself and the family. The venue was another disaster. The parking lot was full of boats that were supposed to be cleared out, but weren't. So we had to hire a valet at the last minute. The photographer we'd chosen specifically for his style couldn't make it, and the replacement was nothing like what we wanted. There was no discount, of course. The cake, which had been beautiful, was left outside in the sun and started to melt. But I pushed through it all. I walked down the aisle unaided, stood as straight as I could, and did my best to focus on what really mattered, marrying the love of my life. I made it through the pictures, the cake cutting, and even managed a slow dance, but it exhausted me. I spent our honeymoon in a wheelchair, paying the price for my determination. When we finally returned home, I was starting to regain some strength, but the pain was still a constant companion. I had lined up a job, so things were looking up, or so I thought. But then we discovered that we'd been robbed while we were away. And to top it all off, it took six months and a complaint to the Better Business Bureau to finally get our wedding video. Story 12. This story isn't mine, but it's one that will always stick with me because of how tragically it unfolded. It happened at my sister-in-law's wedding, a day that was supposed to be filled with joy, laughter, and celebration, but instead turned into something out of a nightmare. It was, without a doubt, one of the worst experiences I've ever been a part of, and the memory of it still sends a chill down my spine whenever I think about it. The wedding had been beautiful. Everything went off without a hitch, from the ceremony to the initial part of the reception. My wife's sister and her new husband were over the moon, surrounded by family and friends who had come together to celebrate their love. The atmosphere was electric with happiness, and you could see the smiles on everyone's faces as they settled in for the toasts and speeches. Then, during the best man's toast, something unimaginable happened. The groom's mother, who had been sitting at the head table, suddenly slumped over. At first, there was confusion. Some people thought she might have fainted or simply felt unwell from the excitement of the day. But when it became clear that something was seriously wrong, the mood in the room shifted instantly from festive to frantic. Panic erupted as people rushed to her side, trying to figure out what was happening. The best man, who had been in the middle of his speech, stopped mid-sentence, his face going pale as he dropped the microphone. Someone called 911, and the room, once filled with laughter and applause, was now heavy with fear and worry. It felt like an eternity before the paramedics arrived, but in reality, it was probably only a few minutes. They worked on her right there in the reception hall, but there was nothing they could do. She had suffered a brain aneurysm, a sudden, catastrophic event that took her life in an instant. One moment, she had been smiling, celebrating her son's wedding, and the next, she was gone. The entire room was in shock. People were crying, some in disbelief, others just sitting there, unable to process what had just happened. The bride and groom were devastated, their joy shattered in the blink of an eye. It was supposed to be the happiest day of their lives, but it had turned into a scene of unimaginable grief. After the paramedics left, taking the groom's mother with them, there was this eerie silence in the room. Nobody knew what to do or say. The reception was supposed to go on, but how could it, after what had just happened? The family decided to serve the food that had already been prepared, for those who wanted to stay and eat, but the celebration was over. Most of the guests quietly left, offering their condolences to the bride and groom as they made their way out. The reception that had been planned with so much care and excitement ended before it really began. There were no more toasts, no dancing, no cutting of the cake. The joy that had filled the room just an hour earlier was gone, replaced by a deep, aching sorrow. The couple never got to have a proper wedding reception, and it's something that has haunted them ever since. Story 13 Sometimes the best stories come from the most unexpected turns in life, and my wedding day is definitely one of those tales. Looking back, it's hard not to laugh at the sequence of events that led to our impromptu elopement, a day that was anything but traditional, but perfect in its own way. It all started just a few days before what was supposed to be our wedding. I found myself in the hospital, facing an emergency surgery. The timing couldn't have been worse, 
but life has a funny way of throwing curveballs when you least expect them. Three days before the big day, I was lying in a hospital bed, hooked up to IVs, and trying to wrap my head around the fact that our carefully laid plans were rapidly unraveling. The surgery went well, thankfully, but I was in no shape for a formal wedding. As I lay there recovering, my fiancé and I started talking about what really mattered to us. The more we talked, the more we realized that the wedding itself, the big event with all the bells and whistles, wasn't what we cared about most. What mattered was the commitment we were making to each other, and we didn't need a fancy ceremony to do that. So, on a whim, we decided to elope. We didn't need a dress, a tux, or a perfectly decorated venue. We just needed each other and a place where we could say our vows. After a quick discussion, we agreed to head to a bar that held some special memories for us, where we'd had our first date, where we'd spent countless nights talking about our future. A few days after I was discharged from the hospital, we walked into that bar, both of us wearing jeans and grinning like a couple of kids about to pull off the best prank ever. We found a quiet corner, exchanged our vows, and just like that, we were married. It was simple, it was spontaneous, and it was perfect. No stress, no fuss. Just the two of us, exactly how we wanted it. Of course, there was one small hitch, telling my mom. As soon as the words left my mouth, I knew I was in for it. She was, and still is, livid about the whole thing. In her mind, weddings are meant to be grand affairs, with family and friends gathered to celebrate. The fact that we had eloped in jeans at a bar was something she just couldn't wrap her head around. To this day, she's still upset that we didn't have a traditional wedding, and I can't say I blame her. I probably could have broken the news a bit more gently, maybe found a better way to explain why we did what we did. But despite her anger, I have no regrets. Our wedding may not have been what anyone expected, but it was exactly what we needed. It was real, it was us, and it's a story we'll be telling for the rest of our lives. It's funny how the things that seem like obstacles at the time, like being hospitalized days before your wedding, can end up leading to the best stories. We didn't have a big ceremony, we didn't have a reception, but we had each other, and that's all we really needed.